The truth of the matter is, as divided as we are, the only way forward for democracy is unity. Consensus, the only way. May we follow his wisdom and his timeless truth and reach consensus on the basic fundamental principles we all agree on. Honoring Bob Dole, the late senator now lying in state in the Capitol Rotunda, his wife Elizabeth resting her head on his flag-draped casket. President Biden calling him one of America's greatest patriots. Tonight, the FDA authorizing boosters for 16 and 17 year olds. More than 200 million Americans now fully vaccinated amid a spike in cases across the U.S. during the holiday season. Hospitalizations up 25% from a month ago, nearly every patient unvaccinated. The Delta variant by far the dominant strain in the U.S. Tonight, rapper Travis Scott breaks his silence over the concert tragedy in Houston where 10 people died. Scott claiming he had no idea people were being hurt while he was performing at the Astro World Festival and didn't know about the deaths. What he's now saying about urging crowds to rage while he's on stage. The breaking news tonight, the verdict in the Jesse Smollett trial. I showed him! Oh my God! The graphic new images at the trial of former police officer Kim Potter. Police videos showing what happened seconds after Officer Potter shot and killed Dante Wright, claiming she mistook her gun for her taser. His girlfriend sobbing on the stand. The chilling details tonight about an alleged mass shooting plot at a university in Florida, foiled possibly hours before it was about to happen. The toxic water crisis in Hawaii, hundreds of families, most of them military, unable to drink their water. Residents complaining water from the taps smells like gas. Millions of gallons of fuel leaking from underground tanks at a Navy facility built during World War II. Tonight, our conversation with legendary comedian Louis Black, injecting humor into his disagreement with Spotify. This is just a, you know another way of of creating income, uh, of, of not creating it, of, of, of the income that we, you know, that, that, that comics deserve. And so it's, it's not new. We've always been screwed. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Deirdre Bolton in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us on another busy news night. We begin tonight with the verdict in the trial of the actor Jesse Smollett. He was a rising star on the popular show Empire when he claimed that he was the victim of a racist and homophobic attack. The incident making national headlines back in 2019. And then the bombshell. Police saying it was a hoax. Two brothers, former extras on the show, claimed Smollett paid them to fake the attack. Both testifying last week, the actor asked them to rough him up near a surveillance camera. Smollett took the stand in his own defense, calling them liars. But ultimately, a jury not buying his performance during nine hours of deliberations. ABC's Alex Perez leads us off with how they ended up coming back with guilty verdicts. Tonight, a jury in Chicago finding actor Jesse Smollett guilty on five counts of felony disorderly conduct and not guilty on one count of felony disorderly conduct. Prosecutors argued Smollett staged a racist and homophobic attack on himself back in January of 2019 when he told investigators he was walking home from this subway shop and two men attacked him, yelling racial and homophobic slurs and putting a noose around his neck. Authorities began questioning Smollett's story when he declined to fully cooperate with the investigation. The prosecution's star witnesses, the Osindaro brothers, who testified Smollett hired them to carry out the attack. But the defense argued in court that investigators rushed to judgment, Smollett himself taking the stand, telling the jury the ordeal was not a hoax, and contradicting the Osindaro brothers, saying on the witness stand that they were trying to extort $2 million from him. But during cross-examination, then said the brothers never directly contacted him for the money. Smollett also testifying he and one of the brothers, Ebimbolo Sindaro, had sexual encounters. Alex Perez joins me now. Alex, how much time is Smollett possibly facing? 
Hey, Deidre, he could face up to three years behind bars for those felony charges that he was convicted on, but he likely won't face any prison time because he doesn't have a criminal record. He's likely looking at probation or community service. Deidre? And Alex, the city of Chicago has said it wants Smollett to pay back the money it spent on the investigation. What's the latest on that? Yeah, city officials have been adamant about that, more than $100,000 that they're trying to get back for all those investigators who spent many hours working on this case. Smollett and the city have been really arguing this out in court, and a lot of that was really on hold until this criminal case uh, wrapped up. And now that it's over, we expect the city will go after that money that they've been looking for. Deidre? Alex Perez, thank you very much. Now to the pandemic and the move by officials today to get more teenagers boosters. The idea to slow what is becoming a concerning winter surge. So teens 16 and 17 years old will now be able to receive Pfizer booster shots. Health officials warning the new surge is being driven by children and the unvaccinated. But many parents remain hesitant to get their children vaccinated. There are still 95 million Americans who are completely unvaccinated. Here's ABC's Whit John. Tonight, the CDC giving the green light for 16 and 17 year olds to get booster shots at least six months after their second dose. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky saying with waning vaccine immunity and the new Omicron variant, boosters are a critical tool. We're facing a variant that has um, the potential to require more immunity to be protected. This move comes 24 hours after Pfizer released early data, which suggests when the standard two-dose vaccine took on the new variant, antibody levels dropped 25 times lower. But the booster shot restored high levels of antibodies that could take on the variant. Three million newly eligible teens can start getting those third shots right away. There's enough real world data to suggest that the rare cardiac side effect, myocarditis, is very rare and the benefits far outweigh the risk when it comes to getting this vaccine. This following a new study from Israel showing people who got the Pfizer booster were 90% less likely to die from a Delta infection than people who got just two doses of the vaccine. Officials insisting there is plenty of supply, but some are still struggling to get appointments for boosters. I'm past my six months and I really wanted to get the booster. Been a little stressful, especially with the holidays and stuff coming up. Meanwhile, it's the Delta variant fueling the winter surge and a jump in hospital admissions in at least 30 states as teams of active military fan out to hard hit areas to help ease the strain. I'm tired of it. Us nurses, other co-workers, respiratory therapists, all the medical team, we are tired. And COVID cases among children are helping to drive the wave of new cases. Since infections were at their lowest point over the summer, pediatric cases have soared 884%. And children under five are still not eligible for the vaccine. But despite the growing safety evidence, a new poll shows roughly two-thirds of parents of elementary school-aged children are either holding off on getting their younger kids vaccinated or refuse to do so. In Massachusetts, families say anti-vaccine protesters harassed them as they brought their children to a school vaccination clinic. People were having uh, things thrown at them, water bottles, um, things thrown at their cars. The experience, they say, left the kids terrified. She's upset. Oh, am I going to be okay now that I got this? Because she has old men screaming at her. The CDC director says they've seen no signs of serious side effects in younger children and are actively considering when they, too, could need booster shots. We're first starting to get our 5 to 11-year-olds uh, vaccinated. We'll look again at the 12 to 15-year-olds, of course, um, at, with the FDA in real time, and we, again, will want to act swiftly. Whit Johnson joins me now. The CDC is still looking at the data on boosters for younger teens, but for those 16 and 17-year-olds, can they get those boosters immediately? Deirdre, that's right. Thousands of pharmacies, doctor's offices, and vaccination sites across the country will immediately start offering those booster shots for teenagers 16 and 17 years old. Health officials say they are also going to right away start exploring the data for those younger groups of kids. Deirdre? Whit Johnson, thank you. Now to the chilling details about an alleged mass shooting plot at a university in Florida foiled possibly hours before it was about to happen. Authorities have arrested a student saying they found a gun and ammunition. Other students had notified police after claiming he posted alarming messages on Snapchat. Here is ABC's Victor Okendo. 
Tonight, Florida police say they stopped this student, 19-year-old John Higgins, who they say wanted to carry out another Columbine massacre. We've had several mass shootings throughout the years in our country, but he specifically referenced Columbine. The chief of Daytona Beach PD says they caught Higgins at his apartment with a backpack containing this high-powered collapsible rifle and hundreds of rounds of ammunition that he allegedly planned to use to attack students on the campus of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University on the final day of school before winter break. This was all a part of the plan because today the campus will be packed because everybody has to be there to take their final exam. Police saying they acted on a tip from two students worried about Snapchat group messages they received. By the grace of God, those two students came forward and thwarted at that plan. Victor Okendo joins us now. Victor, tonight police releasing more details about the suspect's plan. Deirdre, police say that Higgins planned on visiting a gun range before going to the school and that it appears he sold his vehicle to pay for the weapon and that ammunition. Tonight, he is being held without bond and is due in court tomorrow. Deirdre. Victor, our thanks to you. Now to the manslaughter trial of former Minnesota police officer Kim Potter, who claims she mistook her gun for her taser when she shot and killed Dante Rice. New graphic images were revealed in court that showed what happened right after Potter fired that fatal shot. Wright's girlfriend sobbed as she described how she tried to save him. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, for the first time, we see the moments after Dante Wright was shot by former police officer Kim Potter when his car takes off, crashing head-on into another vehicle. Get out of the car so we can help him! This new body camera video showing the chaotic aftermath. Who's also in the car? Huh? Elena Albert Payton, who was in the car with Wright, injured and sobbing. The 20 year old who had recently started dating Wright, taking the stand today, describing those harrowing moments. I just remember like hearing like just like the 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 boom, the bang of the gun. Albert Payton saying she tried to save Wright's life. I took my belt off and I just grabbed like whatever was in the car, put it on his chest. Like, I, I, you know, you've seen movies and TV shows and I didn't know what to do, so I just, I just put my hands over his chest and I just tried to hold it in. Even taking a video call from Wright's mother, who was desperately trying to reach him after being disconnected. I, know, I was just delirious. I was just screaming like they just shot him. They shot him. <laughs> and then I pointed the camera on him. And I'm so sorry. During that traffic stop in April, Potter, a 26 year veteran of the force, says she mistook her handgun for a taser after Wright struggled to get away from another officer trying to arrest him for a misdemeanor warrant. I grabbed the wrong You can see her collapse to the ground moments after the shooting. Potter now facing first and second degree manslaughter charges. The defense tonight pressing Albrecht Payton on what Wright was trying to do after he was shot in an effort to show that Wright intentionally drove away and endangered lives. His hands were never on the wheel. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, late today, Kim Potter's attorney asked for a mistrial. On what grounds? Right, Deirdre. So the judge actually denied that request from the defense for a mistrial. The defense saying the state presented irrelevant information having nothing to do with Potter's thought process, but the prosecution saying it is all relevant and that Potter's actions endangered those around her. Testimony continues tomorrow, Deirdre. Stephanie Ramos, thank you very much. New York Attorney General Letitia James ending her campaign to be the state's next governor today, writing in a tweet, I have come to the conclusion that I must continue my work as Attorney General. There are a number of important investigations and cases that are underway, and I intend to finish the job. One of those investigations involves a former President Trump. We are bringing in right now ABC's Aaron Katarski for more. Aaron, great to see you. You too. So what is the New York AG pursuing here? Well, we learned today that she wants to depose former President Trump as part of her civil investigation into his namesake family real estate firm. The Attorney General's office has been investigating whether the Trump Organization committed some kind of financial fraud 
over the way it valued its real estate holdings. They told lenders one thing, they told tax authorities another thing, and Letitia James signaled today that she wanted to depose former President Trump early next month by January 7th. January 7th. Okay, awfully close to another significant day, January 6th. We'll come back to that in a minute. What kind of documentation does the state AG's office have? Well, they have all the all the records about what the uh, the Trump organization did when they were talking to lenders seeking loans, how they valued holdings perhaps one way, and then when they were seeking tax breaks and the like, and, and then when it came to actually paying taxes, what did the Trump organization say the, uh, the, the values were then? And they have to compare column A and column B to see if they match. This same information is being scrutinized by prosecutors with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office to see if criminal charges are warranted. And we know that the former president fought the Manhattan DA's office all the way to the Supreme Court twice in order to, to try and block access to his tax returns, ultimately unsuccessfully. So there's the criminal side and, and, and with James now pursuing a deposition on the civil side. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I kind of do. What are the chances on a scale of one to 10 that a criminal case is brought? There, there's a chance there's a criminal case. The, the Manhattan DA, who is leaving office by the end of the year, will have to decide whether there's enough to bring a case against the former president now or whether that has to kick to his successor. And, and they're looking at all of the documents, but they also need a critical part, to address, and that is the former president's intent. It may be one thing to value your holdings differently. Was there an intent to evade the law when you did it? And that's what the decision is going and to be. And that's really on. key to your point from a legal perspective. Have to have intent in order to, to make it a crime. As for Letitia James herself, the state AG, what do you make of her political choice? Well, it's interesting that she says she wants to depose the former president and, and then all of a sudden is not running for uh, the, the governor of New York. She says she wants to finish the job of being the state attorney general because there are so many investigations. In truth, Deidre, she was not polling very well compared to the incumbent, Kathy Hochul, who took over after former Governor Andrew Cuomo resigned in disgrace. And according to the state's Democratic chairman, Letitia James uh, just wanted to uh, not, not do this to the party. She wanted to, to have a unified front going in. And uh, Governor Hochul today said that President Trump, former President Trump, and the NRA should uh, not be having a very good day because Letitia James is going to be staying as the Attorney General. Yeah, that is at least one organization that has to be really nervous. Aaron, I want to come back. I got distracted, but we alluded to the January 6th investigation. What is the very latest with that? Well, the former president, as we say, does not like to cooperate with investigations that try to touch his personal records, his tax returns, any financial information. And he has sought to shield more than 700 documents from the House Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. Today, the Washington, D.C. Federal Appeals Court said that he couldn't do it, that his claim of executive privilege fell short because the current president, President Biden, had already decided that the public has a weighty interest in seeing the documents because Congress wants to prevent another attempt to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power. We'll see now whether the former president goes to the Supreme Court. I think he will. Aaron, thank you, as always, for your amazing reporting. Aaron Katarski with us there. Tonight, New York City became the largest jurisdiction in America to allow non-citizens to vote in local elections. The city council granting the right to more than 800,000 legal residents. This is in stark contrast to states that have been restricting certain types of voting. The legislation was approved over the objections of the mayor, who questioned if the council had the power to grant voting rights to non-citizens. Now to Hawaii, where days after the state dealt with those torrential rains, two of a walk whose main wells are shut down as a precaution after a fuel leak from a World War II era base. Now potentially thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people could be affected. Our Will Carr is in Hawaii tonight. Tonight, the safety of the water supply for hundreds of thousands of people on Oahu in question. This is crossed off. The water in my hall's house is off limits. From... And it smelled like I was pumping gas in my car. Paul and at least 1,500 other families in Honolulu, many military, started seeing fuel in their water about two weeks ago. A lot of us got sick at the same time. Headaches, nausea, stomach pain. Even my cats were vomiting. 17-year-old Jaden Bonilla rushed to the emergency room with a severe rash and swelling. 
and residents continue to report tainted, cloudy water. When you let it sit, this is what you get. You can see that translucent sheen. According to the Navy, the fuel came from the Red Hill Fuel Facility, which was built during World War II and stores millions of gallons of fuel. And that leaky fuel facility sits only 100 feet over a major aquifer that supplies water to Honolulu. We are on the precipice of a major disaster. We've already seen the disaster happening, and it's a foreshadow of something that could be even worse if action is not taken quickly. Our Will Carr joins us now from Hawaii. Will, you just spoke with a member of the Board of Water Supply there. He's issuing a dire warning tonight. That's right, Deirdre. We just spoke with the chief engineer for the water board here. He says, without a doubt, fuel is already in that aquifer. It's just a matter of how much. And he is calling this situation a ticking time bomb. He says that the Navy needs to get the fuel out of those tanks immediately. The Navy says that it's testing. And in the meantime, it's offering water at water points like the one behind me to all the members of the military who've been affected. Deirdre. Thank you, Will. When we come back, the defense resting in that high-profile trial of former Silicon Valley favorites Elizabeth Holmes. We'll look at the evidence. President Biden calling the leader of Ukraine after his tense chat with Vladimir Putin, what we know. But up next, superstar Travis Scott speaking out for the first time about his Astro World Festival performance where 10 people died. Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, they're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Take a look at this surveillance video. That flying debris is from a tornado blowing through. That driver on the right had just started his shift. And what's hard to make out is the fact that the bus is flipping from the twister. Fortunately, he made it out okay. 
Rap superstar Travis Scott breaking his silence about his Astroworld Festival performance in Houston last month that ended with at least 10 dead. ABC's Matt Gutman has more on what he had to say about the victims' families. Tonight, hip-hop superstar Travis Scott insisting he could not hear the desperate cries from his fans begging him to stop the show. Did you hear any of those screams? Nah, man. And you know, it's so crazy because I'm that, I'm that artist too. Like, you know, anytime you can hear something like that, you want to stop the show. You want to make sure, you know, fans get the proper attention they need. Thousands that needed attention, people crushed in the surging crowd, trampled under piles of bodies. In a nearly hour-long interview with radio host Charlemagne the God about his performance last month at his Astroworld Festival in Houston, Scott denying his music and his history of encouraging concert goers to rage played a role. Do you feel like you're being villainized? I feel like people understand that what, what my heart wasn't there to be the villain, you know. I was there to be like a hometown hero. The best-selling artist and partner of Kylie Jenner saying he didn't know exactly what had happened until after the show. He also spoke about the families of the 10 people killed, the youngest just nine years old. Some of them rejecting his offers to pay for funeral costs. At a time they're grieving and they're trying to find understanding and, you know, they want answers. And it, it's not about it's not about that, you know. Um, I'm always going to be here you know, to want to help them. In that interview, Scott describing the past month as an emotional roller coaster. But according to the attorney representing one of the victim's families, Scott has not shown any remorse or a sense of responsibility. In 50 some odd minutes, he didn't even say sorry. Um, every time that he tries to shift blame, uh, every time that he makes excuses, uh, he just adds to the pain of these families who lost loved ones. Absolutely heart-wrenching. Matt Gutman joining me now. We heard the attorney's comments. So where do things stand with the legal challenges facing Scott? Deirdre, there are a lot of legal challenges. So far, there are about 300 lawsuits in the works alleging misconduct and negligence. One of those lawsuits is a class action suit being brought by an attorney representing 2,000 of those 50,000 concert goers. He is seeking $10 billion in damages. Now, all of those lawsuits are being consolidated and will be handled by a single judge, but all of this could take years to process. Deirdre. Thank you, Matt Gutman. Still ahead here on Prime, the reality star now facing up to 40 years in prison, crying as he was led away in handcuffs. The battle between comedians and Spotify. We speak with Lewis Black about it. And is the recent spike in gun sales leading to more violence in the streets? So we take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. This is allegedly the color of the year. extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say, oh my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. 
Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back, let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back. And now to an alarming new report on guns and crime by our partners at 538 and The Trace. They analyzed fresh data from the ATF that suggests the recent spike in gun sales could be responsible for the surge in violent crime across the country. Here's a look by the numbers. American civilians have purchased some 19 million firearms from March 2020 when we first saw major COVID outbreaks until the end of that year. In just nine months, U.S. gun sales shattered all other yearly sales records. Meanwhile, shootings nationwide spiked. In over a dozen cities, homicides rose by 50% or more, even as the country went into lockdown. ATF data also showing that in 2020, police recovered two times as many so-called time-to-crime guns as they had the previous year. These are guns found at crime scenes that were purchased within the year, meaning they were most likely brought by the person who used them during the crime. Specifically, 87,000 of those guns were recovered in 2020. We do need a caveat here, though. We still can't say for sure that higher gun sales leads to more violent crime, but these numbers support a causal relationship. As one expert puts it, if increases in firearm access are associated with increases in violence, we are in for a very rough time ahead. We still have a ton to get to here on Prime. The cross-country storm taking shape that could lead to severe weather, depending on where you are, and how secondhand shopping has become huge this holiday season. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. time, anytime, Nightline. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom, my wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. 
What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is Freeze, all Maggie. about. Right, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people news. squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. More American teens will soon be better protected against COVID-19. Both the FDA and CDC now authorizing Pfizer's booster shot for 16 and 17 year olds. Early data suggesting getting a third shot appears to stand up against Omicron. When you get that third shot boost, it dramatically increases the level of laboratory projected protection. This is good news about the booster protection. Pfizer saying we may even need a fourth booster to offset the new variant's impact. When we see real world data, we'll determine if the Omicron is well covered by the third dose and for how long. And uh, at a certain point, I think we will need the fourth dose. Health officials working hard to stay ahead of Omicron and the Delta variant, which is largely to blame for rising COVID-19 numbers. 117,000 Americans infected with COVID last week, an 83% increase since late October. High stakes talks continue over Russia's military buildup along Ukraine's border. President Biden today speaking by phone with Ukraine's leader. After that call, the White House says the president will speak to the leaders of nine NATO member countries in Eastern Europe to brief them on his conversation Tuesday with Russian President Vladimir Putin and developments in the region. The president told reporters Wednesday he was straightforward with the Russian leader. There were no mixed words. It was polite, but I made it very clear. If, in fact, he invades Ukraine, there will be severe consequences. Reality TV star Josh Duggar is now facing up to 40 years in prison and half a million dollars in fines. A jury finding the 33-year-old guilty of two counts of child pornography in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Duggar was in tears as he was led away in handcuffs. The defense had claimed an expert hacker had remotely downloaded material onto Duggar's computer. The Justice Department says Duggar had altered his hard drive to escape detection from pornography detecting software. In 2015, TLC canceled its show 19 Kids and Counting, which Duggar starred in. Following revelations, he molested four of his sisters and a babysitter. A lawyer says he plans to appeal. In Michigan, attorney Jeffrey Feiger announced two lawsuits filed by one of the victim's families in the Oxford High School shooting, naming the school district, the superintendent, and others responsible. The teen suspect in the case, Ethan Crumbly, is charged as an adult. There's a responsibility that our society shares in protecting our children. There is a responsibility among teachers, counselors, and school administrators who could easily easily have prevented and stopped the slaughter. Feiger says he filed on behalf of Jeffrey and Brandy France. Their daughter Riley was shot in the neck and survived. Her sister was near her and was not physically hurt. Starbucks workers at a Buffalo, New York location have voted to unionize. It comes despite the company's opposition. If the labor board certifies the vote, which could take a week, it will mark the first time employees at a Starbucks-owned store in the U.S. have unionized. The National Labor Relations Board is still counting votes for two other stores. The workers who were pushed for the union 
want these three stores to vote individually so that the tallies will count store by store. The company actually was asking the NLRB to open it up to the workers of all 20 stores in the area and to count all those votes as one. But in the end, the NLRB sided with the, the union's approach on this. Next tonight, a major storm taking shape in the West, sweeping across the country. Alerts across more than a dozen states from California to the Great Lakes. ABC's chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, tracking it all. Good evening, Ginger. Good evening to you, Deirdre. Can you believe that Denver has not yet had measurable snow this season? That's two and a half weeks past their latest record for measurable snow. So we have blown the record here and we may finally see a little bit tomorrow, but here's how it's going to all lay out. It's going to be a lot of bit for many more folks from the Rockies up through, say, Minneapolis and central Wisconsin. On the southern end of it, it's not just going to be windy, but we have severe storm for in the forecast. So let me kind of time it out for you. It's through the day Friday that that low and the training cold front start to kick things up. The snow on the northern end, you can see parts of Iowa up through, say, Wausau, Wisconsin and Minneapolis getting into that snow action, but record highs on the southern side. Houston could break a record. They already broke an all time record at Houston Hobby today up to, say, Tennessee. Now that heat and then the f cold on the back side of it is going to help fuel these severe thunderstorms of which I think after midnight look like it's going to be the worst from southern Indiana, Evansville down to Paducah. We do see a tornado threat developing during this time too. One of the worst things is an overnight tornado. So anybody who's in that region, please be on alert and then talk about those Friday afternoon temperatures. It's not just records in Texas. You could see records all the way east to New Orleans, up into Mississippi and even Tennessee. This stuff, the warm and the breeze and the severe storms, or at least the thunderstorms, start to move to the northeast eventually. But look at that. I wanted to leave you with one last look at who needs to really be on the lookout from Indianapolis back to southern Louisiana. Deidre. Ginger Z, thank you very much. Thank you. Now to the fraud trial of Elizabeth Holmes, founder of the failed blood testing company, Theranos. She took the stand in her own defense, and now both sides have rested their case. ABC's Alex Stone reports. Now to the so-called great resignation and the number of Americans quitting their jobs remaining at a record in October. Some are taking to social media as they leave sharing quit talks to make their move public. ABC's Rebecca Jarvis reports. But I need some time off the hamster wheel to focus on myself and to make an impact in my community. So I quit my job. It's part of the great resignation happening all across the country. But in this case, it's happening on TikTok. They're called quit talks. Users like Marissa Mays and Tiffany Knighton announcing publicly on the social media platform that they're leaving their jobs. This is me 15 minutes after quitting my corporate job. <sighs> They say quitting their day jobs was all about finding happiness and focusing on mental health. I kind of was faced with a decision like, okay, you either need to commit to what you're doing or you need to get out now because you're not happy at all. Dealing with microaggressions in the workplace and uh, inequality, pay disparities, and I chose myself in prioritizing my mental health. According to the Department of Labor, they're not alone. 4.2 million Americans quit their jobs in October bringing the total number just this year to 38.6 million people voluntarily quitting, a record high. On Glassdoor's platform, we've seen more than a 100% increase in mentions of the word burnout in, uh, in reviews that we see. For Gabby Ionello, going public with her resignation helped her launch a podcast career under the name Corporate Quitter for those aiming to follow a similar path. I was like, well, why don't I be that person then to kind of share my story, right? Share the struggles, share when I don't have money or when the budgeting is tight and share the wins. Experts warn the message Quit Talk send could be misinterpreted. You worry at times that people could be burning relationships, burning existing relationships or send themselves up for um, problems with relationships in the future. Next tonight to legendary comedian Lewis Black, who is taking on Spotify. 
urging the music giant to pay royalties to comedians. Our Maria Villarreal spoke with him earlier today and has this report. So first of all, thank you guys both very much for joining us, um, Jim and Lewis. L let's just start really at the beginning. We're talking about Spotify. We're talking about comedians. But what is the crux of the problem that you guys are bringing to the forefront right now? Music has had a great history of royalties being paid in a very appropriate way. Uh, for songwriters, composers, lyricists, they've been paid for decades for their writing. Comedy, on the other hand, hasn't been paid attention to. It has not been paid on the writing side. We're working to negotiate a writing or, or a literary work license for all of our comedians. We have over 300 comedians and Spotify has, has just dropped negotiations and took in a very aggressive move on Thanksgiving Eve of all nights uh, and said, we're taking down your comedians. And so well, here's where we find ourselves. And list those comedians for me so that you know our audience truly understands who or what is at stake here? Well, of course, today we have Grammy nominated Lewis Black with us. Uh, other members are Tom Segura, Tiffany Haddish, Mike Birbiglia, Patton Oswalt, Jeff Foxworthy, Roy Wood Jr. Um, we have estates like Bob Hope and uh, Lucille Ball and Don Rickles and Ralphie May. And we have also many up and coming and just wonderful uh, comedians that what we're about is developing it not for just uh, today, but for tomorrow. Lewis, I was just down at the Comedy Cellar a few days ago, and I have to say, you're, you need no introduction, but for those who just don't know, um, thank you again, uh, Mr. Black, for joining us. I have to say, two Grammys, you're up for another nomination. Clearly, I don't think you're hurting, per se, but really, is this about money, or is it about respect? Is it about... Um, it, it, give me Break it down from an artist's point of view, what, what this is about. It's about the fact that um, it, it took comedy a long time to, to be appreciated as a craft and as an art. I mean, like forever. When you're listening to a comedian on stage, they've written this material. Uh, and if they haven't written it, they've improved it and honed it and worked on it. And, uh, and it's, it's no different than, uh, I mean, I've, I've watched... Uh, you know, I've watched, you can watch a comic, you can go up to them and they will have a, a book filled with uh, hundreds and hundreds of jokes. For me, it's not so much a financial thing. It's also a way in which many young comics, which I wish early on for me had been the case, it just gives them a better income. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and because working from club to club to club is, can, you're not making a lot of money. This is a way in which you can... Uh, finance yourself until you are making the kind of income you want and you should be making that income off the work that you were doing for someone who has been in the business as long as you have this sounds personal yeah it is you've got to say no you can't be pulling this all we're really asking is to just can we just sit down and talk about this Jim, Spotify has released a couple of statements, and one of them they said that they have paid a significant amount of money for comedy content, and they want to continue to do so. Where, where is all this money that they are talking about? Where, where is that money going, and, and who exactly is getting paid here, and in what form? How does that work? What they haven't been paying is what they have been paying to songwriters and composers and lyricists, which is the underlying writing. And so there's the two sides of copyright, and those are the value points that we're trying to fight for. We have been speaking to them, and we have been asking them to be a part of what we're doing, and they take this move, which, which is ridiculous in our eyes. In the music world, there are, there are many uh, performers or musicians that write their own material and perform their own material. And uh, Taylor Swift is an example of that. And so she is, benefits from obtaining a royalty for her writing and a royalty payment for her uh, performance as well. In comedy, most comedians fall into that category. They create and write their own material over the years. They, they build up their material. They tell stories. And they should be paid for that just as much as they are for the performance side, or the performing side of their, uh, their material. I, I've, I've said this. Spotify created, in a sense, was really great it, because it initially uh, it gave a place for... Uh, for all of these comics, all of the, especially the young and rising and the, the ones who are just on that border of becoming really well-known, uh, 
a place of, where they had people had access to their material, and uh, and it was it was really great in terms of that, and it it allowed uh, a, a, it really a, a whole um, the world of comedy to kind of explode in another way, much the way Comedy Central had, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and other platforms, and, and so in a sense, they created their own problem because now that they, now that it's exploded, we kind of go, okay, uh, you scratched our back, you know, we scratched your back, now scratch our back. It's yeah. really it comes down to that. My fear is is that we would lose Spotify completely, and that's terrifying. You know, I mean, I can't, you know, that we need. Okay, yeah. I mean, there's just no ifs, ands, or buts. There are too many people who rely on it now. Uh, is that source of income, and uh, I would hate to see that happen. Hopefully, it would affect Spotify, and that they would, you know, realize they'd made a mistake. So you have all of these, let's just say, millions of listeners that are listening to some of his content. You know, um, they're making money off of him, but not necessarily paying him what they are bringing in. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes. Yeah, so, and actually, it gets back to the point that was just being made too. Um, Historically, music was played on thousands and thousands of, of radio stations. But now with streaming, with terrestrial radio and digital radio, like Sirius and so forth, comedy is everywhere. We're seeing performers that have billions of performances across all of these platforms. And when you uh, do the economics around what they should be paid for the underlying writing for those works, it is measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Our goal is to get started with them. Let's get started together. Find a good point to begin. Start collecting these royalties for our members uh, and other comedians that will hopefully join in as well and um, move on from there. I would imagine that there are also some very young up and coming comedians that are looking to you in this moment. What's, what's your advice right now, Lewis? You know, my advice is, is that, uh, you know, you're, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, get your stuff out there. And certainly we're going to do everything that, uh, certainly I'll do everything I can. And hopefully this won't be that long because I think, uh, I think it's important that uh, you, you, you're paid. You're paid what you're worth. Jim and Lewis, thank you both for joining us today. We really appreciate uh, the perspective and good luck to you both. Thank, thank you, you as well. We asked Spotify to clarify why the streaming service pays a royalty for musical compositions, but not for spoken words or comedians and other creatives. They did not respond to our multiple requests for comment. We do apologize for the te technical difficulties earlier. Back now to Alex Stone's story on the fraud trial of Elizabeth Holmes. After listening to seven days of testimony from Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes, soon jurors will be deciding her fate. The defense resting in a week from Thursday, closing arguments will begin. How do you think your final day of testimony went? Any comment? No. Walking out of federal court, Holmes had little to say about the end of her testimony, her team trying to show that Holmes truly believed in the success of Theranos. On the stand, she emphatically denied she intentionally deceived anyone about her blood testing company, asked if investors lost money because she attempted to mislead them. Holmes answered, of course not. But Ann Copsill, a retired biotech executive, says a lack of evidence proving any success in creating the technology she promoted could hurt her case. Copsill got her Stanford PhD in chemical engineering, the same department Holmes dropped out of. In my mind, there was no technology. I think she's trying to make the case that she believed in it still, but in my mind, there was no basis for that. In court, Holmes acknowledged her device advertised as being able to run over 200 tests on a few drops of blood could really only ever do 12. And she admitted that she added unauthorized logos to reports sent to investors who testified it made it appear to them that the technology was validated by major pharmaceutical companies. I know that we made so many mistakes. But Holmes' main defense is that her former boyfriend and COO of Theranos, Sonny Balwani, controlled her and sexually abused her. Their allegations he firmly denies. During her testimony, Holmes fought back tears at times talking about such abuse. Holmes faces 11 fraud charges and has pleaded not guilty in a week. Jurors could begin deliberating. Alex Stone, ABC News, Los Angeles.
Now to the increase in secondhand shopping. While thrifting has been popular for a while, Gen Zers are making it their first choice for the holiday season. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze has more on it. This is a pop of energy on a cold gray day. It's been two years since Robin Camerote, a mother of three in Virginia, started buying all her clothes secondhand. I haven't looked back. I mean, just the variety um, and the quality of things that you can find have made it so I, I just don't feel like I need to look anywhere else. Now she's putting her passion for thrifting to use, hunting down holiday gifts. I just don't want to be that person that shows up with a printout of what I intended to buy you, but it didn't arrive. Have those gifts arrived on time that you bought secondhand? Yeah, yeah, and I still have a ways to go. For many shoppers like Robin, thrift stores are proving to be faster and cheaper alternatives to some traditional retailers plagued by supply chain bottlenecks. Used goods obviously are already in the country, so you avoid this whole, you know, supply chain logistics snafu that we've gotten into with COVID-19. Economist Mary Lovely says there's been an explosion of purchases of used goods as shoppers try to cut down shipping times and find lower prices. And sellers are flocking to online thrifting marketplaces like ThreadUp or Poshmark, making it easy to earn a few extra bucks. People are saying, hey, I have things that I can sell. And so you're seeing an increase in the supply of these used goods as well, many of them really in excellent condition. A recent survey by Global Data found nearly half of shoppers are considering alternatives like thrifting for holiday shopping because of supply chain concerns. Because we are not constrained by the supply chain, we were actually able to lower our prices. This sweater was marked for $100, and then the seller gave it to me for $47. 21-year-old Natalia Jaime in Chicago is buying her gifts secondhand. She says her generation is embracing thrifting as a way to shop more sustainably. At the end of the day, it's just giving clothes a new life, and there's nothing wrong with that. Less than $20. Less than $20 for leather jackets for the kids. Yes. I feel the stigma is going down, so I feel comfortable giving somebody that's something that's secondhand. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, Washington. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Elizabeth Dole clinging to the casket of her husband, former Senator Bob Dole. All day we have seen people pouring into the Capitol, paying tribute to this leader who was respected by members on both sides of the aisle. That is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, our series of One World, One Pandemic continues. Tonight, we look at the silent crisis caused by this pandemic. So many families now hungry. Our journey to Peru. And we're tracking the latest on those January 6th investigations. Stay with us. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. This is what being live is Free all Jackie, about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay, come on. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Let's do 
Winner of nine Edward R. Murrow Awards, more than any other network, including winning for the third straight year the award for overall excellence in television. ABC News is America's number one news source. With so much at stake, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one newscast and the number one program on television. I'm Deirdre Bolton. Thanks for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News this hour. A federal appeals court has ruled against former President Trump, who was trying to shield documents from the House Committee investigating January 6th. The three-judge panel threw out his arguments of executive privilege, one writing for the court that Congress had, quote, uniquely vital interests in studying the events of January 6th. Rapper Travis Scott speaking out about the Astroworld tragedy in nearly an hour-long interview with radio host Charlemagne the God. Scott insisting he didn't know that anything was wrong until after the show. Hundreds of lawsuits have been filed since the concert. The CDC giving the green light to boosters for 16 and 17 year olds. This comes about a day after Pfizer revealed that their data shows a booster could offer protection against Omicron. Meanwhile, overseas, the UK fears there could be a million new cases by the end of the month. The health minister warning the variant is very different and very virulent. In recent days, with the spread of this variant, many Americans were reminded that this is a global fight. And if one part of the globe is struggling to contain the virus, it could have consequences for everyone. In South America, a dual wrath of hunger and sickness continues to spread, particularly in the country of Peru, which has the highest death per capita rate in the world. In our week-long series, One World, One Pandemic, ABC's Victor Okendo shows us the challenge Challenges on the continent that may affect us all. In 2021, COVID-19 spread across South America at an alarming rate. By May, Latin America and the Caribbean had surpassed a million COVID deaths. In Peru, despite closed borders and nationwide lockdowns, COVID patients overwhelmed the healthcare system. With more than 600 deaths for every 100,000 residents, Peru has the worst death rate per capita anywhere in the world. Describe what the early days of the pandemic were like inside hospitals in Peru. It was very difficult to respond to this a threat because of two reasons. Because we do nothing at the beginning how to, and because we didn't have the means to, to tackle it because the, the size of our health system, the knowledge was very, was minuscule. Now with higher vaccination rates, the number of COVID deaths have decreased. Well, today I received my second doses of AstraZeneca. Once we had the, the vaccines, we've been very successful in implementing the vaccination campaign. UNICEF bringing in equipment, including solar-powered freezers and refrigerators, to help store and transport the vaccine to more remote indigenous communities. But the pandemic has exposed other issues, including a costly healthcare system and lockdowns caused many who were unable to go to work to lose their livelihoods. 30% of the Peruvian population were affected by poverty in 2020, an increase of nearly 10% since the year before. Now we are trying to recover to what we were, to where we were in terms of economic terms. Uh, education is still uh, waiting to go to normal um, and jobs, people are desperate. In a small neighborhood outside the capital of Lima, Olinda Huamani, a single mother of three, used to clean houses and take her children with her. The lockdowns forced her to stop working. Now, she's struggling to feed her children. If we're locked in and don't go out, what will I eat? I'm going to die regardless. 
I thought to myself, what am I going to eat? I'm better off getting COVID and goodbye, it's all over. We don't have anything. Everything you see has been tossed out by others and was picked up from the trash. I would go to the garbage to look and would think there would be COVID in the trash, but thankfully I didn't get it. I would wash the fruit. I would wash it with hot water so my kids wouldn't get sick and they didn't. Only God protected us. Olinda's family is one of many in Latin America and the Caribbean dealing with the effects of hunger, a problem made worse by the pandemic. A UN report finding the amount of people dealing with hunger increased by 13.8 million between 2019 and 2020. The prevalence of hunger is now at 9.1% in the region, the worst numbers in 15 years. The growing poverty making food distribution centers like Oya Comun, where families have access to food essential to survive. Sometimes we only think about kids, but older adults need to be fed, also to have a better quality of life. Lady Barrios Briseño had to move with her three young children into an orphanage so they are fed and have a safe place to sleep at night. Someone I know told me about this place. Surely they saw I had nowhere to go or anything to eat. So I came here and immediately they opened their doors to me. I don't think any mother wants to sleep on the street with her kids and run the risk of them getting sick, hurt, kidnapped. All of that is scary. Peru and the rest of South America continues its vaccination campaign to rise out of the pandemic. How would you describe the current state of COVID-19 in Peru? After two huge waves, we have hope that we have better, a better future because we have reached high levels of vaccination. But yes, we have problems and I hope the, our leaders in Peru, economical, political, social leaders, will find a way to, to lead the country out of this very poor situation. But even as poverty and hunger continue to plague this region of the world, there's still hope. Hopefully next year things get better. I have hope they will. Victor Okendo, ABC News, Miami. Our thanks to Victor. Be sure to tune in to COVID-19, One World, One Pandemic, tomorrow at 8 Eastern, right here on ABC News Live. Now to the verdict in the trial of the actor Jesse Smollett, the Empire actor who claimed he was the victim of a racist and homophobic attack that made national headlines back in 2019. But then the bombshell. Police said it was a hoax. Two brothers, former extras on the show, claimed Smollett paid them to fake the attack. Smollett took the stand in his own defense, calling them liars, but ultimately a jury did not buy his defense. ABC's Alex Perez has the details on the jury's guilty verdicts coming in late tonight. Tonight, a jury in Chicago finding actor Jesse Smollett guilty on five counts of felony disorderly conduct and not guilty on one count of felony disorderly conduct. Prosecutors argued Smollett staged a racist and homophobic attack on himself back in January of 2019 when he told investigators he was walking home from this subway shop and two men attacked him, yelling racial and homophobic slurs and putting a noose around his neck. Authorities began questioning Smollett's story when he declined to fully cooperate with the investigation. The prosecution's star witnesses, the Osindaro brothers, who testified Smollett hired them to carry out the attack. But the defense argued in court that investigators rushed to judgment, Smollett himself taking the stand, telling the jury the ordeal was not a hoax, and contradicting the Osindaro brothers, saying on the witness stand that they were trying to extort $2 million from him. But during cross-examination, then said the brothers never directly contacted him for the money. Smollett also testifying he and one of the brothers, Ebimbolo Osindaro, had sexual encounters. Former Trump White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows taking his fight against the January 6th House Select Committee to a district court judge. Meadows filing a lawsuit against the panel and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi in an attempt to block subpoenas, ordering him to comply with the investigation into the deadly Capitol attack. This as the committee interviews more witnesses today. ABC's Faith Amube is in Washington with the latest. 
Conservative activist Ali Alexander flanked by his attorneys as he walks into his deposition on Capitol Hill Thursday. His team carrying boxes of records for the House Select Committee investigating the Capitol riot by Trump supporters. We provide the committee uh, with thousands of records, hundreds of pages. And, you know, unfortunately, I think that this committee has gone way too much into our personal life, way too much into my First Amendment. But I do recognize that they have a legislative duty to conduct. And so we're here to cooperate. Alexander organized the January 6th Stop the Steal rally, which fired up Trump supporters moments before they stormed the U.S. Capitol. Five people died. Dozens of other officers were injured. The panel questioning him behind closed doors. But Alexander, who led the crowd in chants of victory or death, maintains he played no role in the violence that day, also denying he coordinated the event with members of Congress. So this evidence actually exonerates those members. This evidence actually exonerates me. Trump's former Pentagon chief of staff, who has also been subpoenaed, was also seen entering the Capitol Thursday. These developments coming as the committee moves to hold former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows in contempt of Congress. Meadows was initially cooperating with the panel, but abruptly stopped. He's now suing the committee, asking a judge to block two subpoenas they issued, claiming they were overly broad and unduly burdensome. It's pretty hard to say as a claim of privilege when he turned over information right. as well as wrote a book about the contents of, of what we're discussing. Police are reporting a sharp increase in car thefts and two car brands may be particularly vulnerable. This with an increase in crime, cities are now setting their sights on some automakers to make a change. ABC News' Mona Kosar Abdi explains. As police departments across the country report a dramatic increase in car thefts, one city may now sue two automakers whose vehicles have become a favorite among thieves. Milwaukee is on pace to surpass 10,000 vehicle thefts this year, more than triple the number in 2019. And 68% of the vehicles stolen have been Kia or Hyundai. It should be a priority because it is having a real detrimental impact on the quality of life of thousands of our citizens in this community. Police say half the suspects are age 16 and under. They say teens have glamorized the crime on social media, targeting a particular year of Kia or Hyundai because, according to police, a design flaw that allows them to be stolen without setting off an alarm. What I'm trying to get at is that it doesn't, you don't need any fancy tool to be able to get it started, and that's a concern. The two car companies handed out steering wheel locks this summer after Kia and Hyundai owners filed a class action lawsuit claiming their vehicles were equipped with subpar security measures. Now the city attorney's office is also considering legal action under public nuisance laws. <laughs> Meanwhile, other car thieves are going high tech. Police say criminals are now attaching Apple AirTags to cars to track a vehicle so they can steal it later. By using an iPhone, they can always tell where the vehicle's location is and then they can almost wait and, and, you know, commit the theft on their watch. Police have a few tips for drivers. Park in a garage, inspect your car regularly, consider installing security cameras, and if you have an iPhone, make sure it's on. That way you'll get a notification if an Apple AirTag is moving with you. Now to those major supply chain issues hitting another industry, beverages, soda, water, alcohol, seeing big shortages. Those supply chain issues may have been maddening enough to drive you to drink, but good luck, some say, finding a bottle. Here is ABC's Will Reef. Supply chain headaches are pulsing through nearly every aspect of daily life. In the grocery industry, 5 to 10 percent of typical categories are out of stock, with a 13 percent dearth in beverages. Waters, iced teas, and soft drinks, as well as spirits and beers so thirsted after in the holiday season, are all in shorter supply. What's leaving shelves so parched? Everything from gridlock in trucking and shipping to labor issues to unpredictable weather. But the main culprit, bottles and cans. There just aren't enough to go around. It's the materials that we're needing to make the bottles and cans, and all that shortage trickles down and through the supply chain till we see it in a shortage of product on the shelf. Nearly three quarters of all new beverage products in 2021 were packaged in aluminum cans. That growth in demand has run headfirst into shrinking supply. And small businesses like Detroit-based Casamara Club, which makes non-alcoholic flavored drinks, have had to adapt and improvise at a substantial cost to the bottom line. We stocked up in early November uh, to make sure that we had enough to get us through the holidays and 
dry January, we've probably lost about a month of sales or say 15% of, of what we could have expected by the end of the year. We are switching gears now to bring in a guest who is an expert on responding to unexpected crises. Robert Jensen runs a leading disaster management company that has worked on recovery efforts after disasters such as the Oklahoma City bombing, 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, and the Grenfell Tower fire. He imparts what he has learned in his new book, Personal Effects, what Recovering the Dead Teaches Me About Caring for the Living. Robert, we are so glad you could join us this evening. Thank you so much. One of your jobs in disaster management, which for many of us just seems unimaginable, is to recover and return human remains and possessions to families and governments. In your experience, what helps people move forward after tragedy? Well, a whole bunch of things. And so I describe it as people have a road they go down every day, a path. And all of a sudden, that road is not there. There's a big chasm that's just opened up. And the job of the system is to build a bridge so that people can get on that bridge and get across to what's going to be their new normal. And part of that is dealing with the consequences. It's the things that you do once the fire is out that and the TV cameras have gone. And for a lot of families, especially in the events I go to, there is not that immediate recovery of a loved one or return for a funeral or for disposition. Yeah, it must be and so disconcerting to people, Robert. And I know you have said in the past, even if you can't control the event, you can control the response. But how do you help people manage stress and stay focused? <laughs> Well, what we do is we give them a roadmap. We explain what's going to happen so that they know what their role is because that's that's what people don't have. They don't understand what's next for them. And so we try to say, here's the things that can happen and here are the decisions you get to have. You give control back. Robert, you write about visiting Haiti in 1994 after the U.S. invasion to reestablish democracy and finding people there incredibly resourceful. You have also written in your book that when you returned in 2010 after the earthquake, the country had become aid dependent. So what is your takeaway from disasters when they strike and then how people, others in the world, can help, truly help? Well, it's about resilience. I, I don't have a great crystal ball, but what I have is a lot of history. I've been to two events in my lifetime that have killed almost a quarter of a million people in the time it took for most people to have a cup of coffee in the morning. And what I've seen is that we're not going to prevent those. We're not going to be successful in preventing terrorism 100% of the time. And we're not going to stop accidents from occurring because we're human. So if we know these things are going to occur, what we have to help people focus on is what are the things you do to manage the consequences? Not just survive the event, but what do you do after to help go forward? And to remember that life is going to go on. And life is, is a pretty good thing to have. But there are things you need to do to focus about making sure you understand what the risks are. What can you do to mitigate those risks now? And what can you do to make things more comfortable for yourself if you are involved? So, Robert, can you give us some examples, help if, God forbid, anybody has to go through one of these events and separating out in someone's brain what he or she can control and what he or she can't? Well, I, I use an example of you're on a sailboat crossing the Pacific and a whale breaches and makes your boat sink. That's just bad luck. But preparation was having that life raft. Preparation was having the supplies in the life raft and the skill to know how to use it. And then you're at sea for 30 days till a tanker finds you. That's luck. But being able to survive in your raft for 30 days wasn't luck. So think about where you live. What are the risks? What are the things you need to have to take care of yourself until somebody can come to help? The government's job is life-saving, not recovery. There'll be plans to help with recovery, but that's based on the resources you put aside ahead of time to understand. Robert, many people did not see COVID coming. I think the majority did not. 
You reference in your book where people hoarded toilet paper and other necessities. What is your view on how humans often respond in the moment to crises? It's um, not always panic, but it is a lack of disbelief. And that's a big problem in crisis management. The, we see a lot of people trying to defuse a bomb that's just blown up instead of trying to deal with the aftermath and go forward. And that's because they're in shock. They don't believe this has occurred. And pandemics aren't new. We've lived through several of them. And unfortunately, we'll probably have more. And people want desperately to take action, but if they don't know what action to take, they take whatever action is available, even if it's not productive, and in the end, more detrimental. Robert, thank you so much for the time and sharing your insights with us. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. I hope you have a good night. You too. And of course, you can find personal effects, what Recovering the Dead teaches me about caring for the living wherever books are sold. Still to come, the new law against cigarettes in one country that some say could be transformational. And what do you think the best photo of this year was? With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. We're tracking several headlines from around the world. Shouting insults and a full-out brawl took place in the Turkish parliament after lawmakers debated the budget. The turmoil in parliament is a reflection of bigger frustrations facing the nation as it reels from a currency crash and inflation spiral on the heels of the pandemic. Indian officials have recovered the black box from the helicopter crash site that killed India's defense chief and 12 others. Meanwhile, in New Delhi, Prime Minister Modi paid tribute to the deceased at a funeral ceremony. 
where loved ones were able to say their final goodbyes. Only one of the 14 on board survived. A bold move in New Zealand after its government announced plans to ban young people from ever buying cigarettes in their lifetime. The move is one of the toughest crackdowns on the tobacco industry to date. This would make New Zealand one of the strictest in the world, just behind Bhutan, where cigarette sales are outright banned. The law is expected to take place by 2027. Now to National Geographic's year in pictures with four different and stunning covers. It is a visual retrospective of 2021, capturing our world's year of climate change, conservation, and COVID. ABC's George Stephanopoulos has the details on these stunning images that take us through the ups and downs of a tumultuous year. The covers, iconic. National Geographic magazine photos that inspire, wonder, and evoke emotion, both joyous and challenging. We're not just here to make beautiful pictures that are standalone images. Our goal is to really tell a full story, to drive a narrative through the visual imagery. Their year in pictures issue, a visual retrospective of 2021, includes stories of climate change, conservation, and of course, COVID. In this image, a medical worker in rural Kashmir has driven and walked many hours to find nomadic herders and vaccinate them against the coronavirus. This picture just really captured the extent to which our medical workers all over the world are going to actually get people vaccinated. Here, wild horses in Colorado stampede on land so dry, dust clouds at the slightest touch. In many ways, it's a beautiful picture, but of course, the dust is just billowing at every footstep because the American West is in the midst of a mega drought and it's only getting drier and drier every year. And as temperatures rise across the globe, these beautifully framed penguins, unlike many Antarctic creatures, are a climate success story. This particular type of penguin has been able to thrive and survive in these ice-free um, lands, and their population has actually expanded sixfold since the 1980s. So I hope that these pictures really serve as a reminder to our audience of what's happening right in front of us. That is our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Deirdre Bolton. Thank you for streaming with us. Extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed